Welcome to Bible Breath, where we dig into the Word of God to catch our breath for whatever's coming next. Today we're talking about the Bible, in particular, what it says. And we can illustrate the two main messages of the Bible by, by telling you a story from my childhood. Every 4th of July, when I was young, my family would be invited to a pool party at the house of one of my classmates. And there would be lots of people there. By no means were we the only people invited. Um, on beautiful summer days, the pool would be full of people, lots of people splashing around, having fun. Mostly the kids in the pool and the adults sitting on the patio, having a good time, visiting with one another. Well, there was one particular 4th of July pool party that we were invited to and we were at. I was about 10 years old at the time and there was another family there who had a son named Joey. Joey was a number of years younger than me, so definitely not 10, maybe more like, maybe like four or five at the time. And Joey was going around, going around the pool and, and having a good time. The pool had a shallow end and it had a deep end and the deep end went, I think, eight feet down. Joey didn't know how to swim. And so Joey was supposed to stay in the shallow end, and he did for the most part, but not entirely. There was one part during the party where apparently Joey got out of the shallow end, walked around to the deeper end, saw people having a good time, swimming around in the pool, splashing around, going down the slide, jumping off the diving board, and he thought, that looks like fun. And so little Joey decided to jump in to the deep end, not being able to swim. Maybe he splashed around for a little bit, Trying to, trying to stay on top of the surface, but apparently nobody noticed that Joey, who couldn't swim, was struggling to stay above the water. Maybe because there were so many good conversations happening. Maybe because there were so many people in the pool that just looked like another person splashing around having fun. But eventually, Joey wasn't able to keep himself on top of the water and he started to sink down to the bottom of the pool. And that's where he stayed for I don't know how long before my older brother, Greg, noticed that somebody was at the bottom of the pool. And he went in and he dove in and he pulled him out and saved his life. Joey hasn't forgotten that. He thanks my brother, Greg, every time he sees him. He reminds me of what happened, what my brother did every time, uh, every time he sees me. What does that have to do with the Bible? Uh, just this. Just like there were certain rules that Joey should have followed, rules to stay in the shallow end and stay in the deep end. So also the Bible has rules called laws. And just like when the rules were broken and there were consequences, and then there was some good news when my brother went in and saved him, that also happens in the Bible. There are two main teachings in the Bible. There's the law, the rules that we have to follow, and there's the gospel. There is the good news that God gives us. And the Bible talks about both of them, uses those words very frequently, law and gospel. And we'll start by talking about what the law is. We're going to talk about both of those today, but we'll start with the law. And you know what laws are? Laws are things that you're supposed to do or not to do. There are speed limit signs that you're supposed to not exceed that speed limit. There's even a minimum speed on some highways where you're not supposed to go underneath that. There are, um, there are signs of do not trespass and you're not supposed to go here. Do and do not. Those rules exist in society all over the place. They also exist in the Bible. Jesus was asked about them. He was asked, Jesus, what is, a, what is a good life? And in Matthew chapter, chapter 19, Jesus said, well, a good life, if you want to be good, you know, all on your own, and if you want to be good enough that you're good enough to be with God forever, he said, you should follow the commandments. And then the man asked, which one? And Jesus said, well, well and then he just started to list all sorts of uh, commandments. You might know that there are 10 commandments. And he said, do not murder, which is the fifth commandment, and do not commit adultery, which is the sixth commandment, do not steal, which is the seventh commandment, don't give false testimony, which is the eighth commandment, honor your father and mother, the fourth commandment, and love your neighbor as yourself, which actually isn't one of the particular 10 commandments, but it's a commandment that's elsewhere in the Bible. And Jesus was summarizing that, well, this is what the, what the law teaches us. The law teaches us what to do and what not to do according to God. And then Jesus was once asked, well, which one of those commandments is the most important? And he summarized all of the commands in the Bible, all of the laws by saying this. He said, the most important one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything you have. Love the people next to you just as much as you love yourself. And Jesus was once asked on another time, well, how well should you do this in order for God to be happy with you? And he said, 
Well, you need to be perfect. Do it perfectly. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love your neighbor always as much as you love yourself. The law teaches us what to do and what not to do. And when we compare ourselves to God's expectations, it also teaches us something else. And I'd like to illustrate what that is by having you imagine that there are two cliffs apart from one another, not so close that you can just step across. They're far enough apart from each other that you have to jump across, but it's not an easy jump. And I want you to imagine you're there with a couple of friends and you need to get across to the other side. And so one person volunteers to go and, and they give it their best shot and they jump across to the other one, but they end up falling five feet short. They don't make it. They fall down to the bottom of the ravine. Bad news. Then I want you to imagine that the, a second friend tries and, and they do their best and, and they, uh, they give their best shot, jumping all the way across, but they fall even, well, 15 feet short and they fall down to the bottom of the ravine. And now it's your turn and you feel like you're, you're in pretty good shape. Let's even imagine that you've been training for this your entire life. You knew this jump across the ravine was coming and you knew you were going to have to make it at some point. So you've been training for it. You've been doing all the exercises, strengthening your muscles, practicing, 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 practicing. And here, now here's the moment and you get a nice running start and you start and you run up to the edge. And just as you're about to leap off the edge, you trip over a stone and you stumble all the way down. <laughs> you didn't get very far at all. Now who got the closest? It really doesn't matter. Everybody fell short. Doesn't matter what the distance was, nobody made it. And that's something that the Bible teaches us in regard to how we compare to God's laws, is that we all fall short. Romans 3 says, there's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And boy, that has some results. If we're not perfect, if we fall short, the Bible tells us exactly what that means. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. You know what wages are. They're things that you earn for doing a job. You work for an employer, you earn the wages, the paycheck. But if you spend time working for sin, the wages we earn, it's death. And not just physical death. In Matthew 25, Jesus talked about eternal death as he draws our attention forward to Judgment Day and he says that those who have fallen short will, will be condemned to eternal fire. Eternal fire. And that is exactly how the Bible describes hell. Eternal fire. So the law teaches us some very important things. The law teaches us what to do and what not to do. And it also teaches that I deserve hell because I'm not perfect. We can illustrate it maybe with a mathematical equation. So picture yourself there. Uh, if you were to say you are plus something, you would say, well, I'm plus sin, you would say. There are sins in my life. If I lack something, I'm minus something. You'd say I, I lack holiness. I don't have it, and plus sin minus holiness would equal, according to the Bible, death and hell, which leads to a very important question. If that's the case for you, then why should God ever let you into heaven? There are a couple of different ways you might try to answer that. You might say, well, as long as I try my best, God will let me in. Or, as long as I do more good things than bad things, you know, try to balance it out a little bit. Or you might say, as long as I'm better than most other people, if I can find somebody that I can easily look down on, then, then God will let me in. Or as long as I keep getting better and better and better, as long as I keep progressing in some type of way, then maybe God will let me in. But if you look at that equation that the Bible allows us to put together, plus sin, minus holiness, in all of those situations, there was sin. There was a lack of perfection. So none of those would work. That's the law. It tells me what to do and what not to do and that I deserve death in hell. But thankfully, there's also the gospel. And what does the gospel teach us? John the Baptist summarized what the gospel teaches us. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist was baptizing people when Jesus came walking and John drew everybody's attention to him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And what does that mean? That he takes away the sins of the world? Well, let's go back to the equation. If we are plus sin and minus holiness and equals death and hell, Jesus would be the opposite. Jesus would be plus holiness. He did everything well. He would be minus sin because he never did anything wrong, never crossed any lines that he shouldn't. He always loved God with all his heart and loved others just as much as he would love himself. And so Jesus didn't earn death and hell by his life. Jesus earned heaven, eternal life. And yet that's not what we see Jesus experiencing as he's hanging on a cross. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, he gives us a glimpse into what he's experiencing when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And to forsake someone means to ignore them, to treat them as if they are worth nothing. And that's exactly how God the Father was treating God the Son. He was forsaking him, ignoring him. Jesus was suffering hell, being in a place where God would not go. And why did he do that? Well, he was taking our hell so that we could receive his heaven the one that he earned. I want you to imagine that you are standing in line on judgment day, waiting to be judged. And just imagine there's a, there's a big long line and everybody has their turn and, and there's somebody at the, at the gate that says, oh, well, okay, here's the record on you and you go to heaven, you go to hell. You go to hell, you go to heaven. Somebody making the judgment. And I want you to imagine that you are now second in line and somebody, the person in front of you is somebody that you care about. And you can hear what God says about them. Opens up the book and says, oh, well, according to what I have here, oh, that's not good. Sin, 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 sin. Sorry, you're going to hell. But you don't want them to go to hell. And so you raise your hand very quickly and you say, but, but God, wait. What if you would send me to hell instead of them? What if I would take their punishment? Could you let them into heaven? Will God allow it? Well, then he would say, well, let's open up the book to where you are. And he would look under your name and or let's just imagine that it's me. And he looks up my name and he, he says, oh, nope, sin, 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 sin. Sorry, man. You were already going to hell. I was already going to send you there. You're not giving me anything I wasn't already going to receive. But when Jesus volunteered to be punished, he was giving, he was giving something that you and I could not give anyone. A perfect life that was worth something. The book of Isaiah talked about this happening many, many years before it happened to Jesus on the cross. Isaiah 53 says this. It says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And yet we considered him, Jesus, punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or sin of us all. And that, my friends, is exactly what was happening on the cross. Jesus volunteered to take the punishment for our sins. He switched places with us. He took a punishment he didn't deserve so that we could receive a heaven that we don't deserve. You know what that is? That's good news. And that's one of our Bible buzzwords. Uh, the word gospel literally means good news. And it's the good news that Jesus is our savior from sin. And the Bible talks about that good news in so many places. One of the most famous passages is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus is my savior from sin. And so there you have two very different teachings. You have the law which says, do this and don't do that, which is an important teaching because we need guidance in our lives. We need to know what's right and wrong. God designed the laws not to hurt us, but to help us to understand what's gonna benefit our relationships and uh, equip us to serve our communities and our churches and our friends and our neighbors and even our enemies in the very best way. Do it this way, not that way. But when we break that law, when we fall short of living up to God's laws, 
Well, then there's the gospel, which doesn't say do and don't do, which says it's done. It's done. Jesus forgave you. You now have a place in heaven through faith in him. And you find both of these teachings, law and gospel, throughout the Bible. If you were to split up the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in the Old Testament, you're going to find more laws, but you're also going to find gospel there. There's the gospel in Isaiah chapter 53, for example. And in the New Testament, you're going to find both of them there as well. You're, you're going to find a little bit of law, and you're also going to find a whole lot of gospel. In fact, the Gospels, those are the, that's the nickname for the books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which all record the events of the life of Jesus, the one who gave us the Gospel. And though there are those two teachings, law and Gospel, they work together to do something really important when it comes to the Bible. They work together to really emphasize the main purpose of the Bible. In John chapter 20, John writes, These are written, Scripture is written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. They help to point us to Jesus and the good news that he's our savior from sin. And they also do something different. In Romans chapter 15, it says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. And I think you know, there are so many things in this world that rob you of your hope. So much bad news, so much pain, so much suffering. God wanted to give you hope that the trouble and the bad news and the pain and the suffering and the sin of this world and the sin in our hearts, it's not going to get the best of you in the end. The good news of the gospel is that it won't. You have hope because of what Jesus did.